Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Michael Lingenfelter, and I'm here with the Aging Athlete Guide. It's going to be a show on how to get the most out of yourself so you can get the most out of what you love to do without worrying about having to slow down because of your age. And today we're joined by Mikola Munter. Mikola was a successful competitor as well as stallion rider for many years in Denmark. She has shown at international com competitions since she was in her 20s, and her most successful horses have been Leonberg and My Lady, with whom she had shown for the Danish team. She and My Lady actually placed in two World Cup finals, being the highest price money winner pair at Global Dressage festival for several years and showed at the world equestrian games in 2014 uh, they have been placed at many shows all over the world and in 2016 they were placed 20th on the fei world rankings mikla now owns a barn in wellington where she boards teaches and trains horses in the summer she's traveling in europe and the u.s to give clinics and her main focus this is my favorite part is in developing horses and riders to um, help teach them uh, use their body correctly so that the horses can move as freely as possible without restrictions from the rider. So that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today, um, what it's like to ride at a high level and how to keep yourself in riding shape as you get older. So welcome to the show, Mikola. Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm so happy to have you here. And I know you just mentioned you're in Florida. Um, what is the weather like in Florida right now? It's hot. It's hot. <laughs> it's just hot. <laughs> hot. Okay, so I know I know you've been doing this for a while. You've had a lot of experience. Um, you're getting into a part of your life where you probably have to do a little bit more maintenance to maintain your rider shape. So I would love if you could share with us right now um, what level of strength and fitness is necessary to participate at the level that you ride at. A high level of fitness, I think. Um, we cannot just keep going the way we did when we were in the 20s or 30s or 40s. <laughs> I feel like um, when I hit 50 last year, uh, it really went uh, downhill quickly. And I realized now it's time for me to start uh, doing something other than just ride. Because honestly, I haven't really done anything else my entire life than ride horses. And I've done some yoga, uh, I'd say maybe once a week, but not not for, not enough. So no. things started to p get painful and I have a lot of horses at the moment that are at the highest level. So that also demands, demands a lot of strength from my body, from my core. And I just got more and more sore. I had a little back injury last winter and couldn't through it. And we cut off? No? You're good. Okay. So uh, I had a little injury and it took me a long time to get over it in my back. And I was struggling and struggling and I was going to massages and stretching and yoga and chiropractor and it was just not enough. And I actually started um, doing Pilates and taking Pilates classes and I go every day now. Um, after work I go and I've done that for three months and I will say it has been a major change. Um, so it's feeling really good now. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you started noticing that things started going downhill, like you said. So, um, was it something when you say you had, you were sore and you had a um, back problems, was it a, a very, acute or specific injury or was just this something that was happening over time that kind of caught up to you so i i've always struggled a little bit with my back uh been super hard on my body since i was very young um and uh I, so i've had problems and gone to the chiropractor and fixed it and done a little stretching but i haven't really taken good care of myself um i had a horse that went crazy at a horse show last winter and it was in the morning and I was a little stiff and it just tweaked something in my back and it was just it just went out and it took it's taken me six months to get over that got it so in the meantime throughout this this period of time you've done things to try to put what we'll call band-aids on it or um, trying to address the symptoms by doing massage or chiropractic or stretching and never really um, going after the underlying cause, which may have been you weren't strength training the way you needed to. Correct. 
Correct. Got it. So you've been writing for a while, like you said. So I would personally love to hear your story. What led you to becoming a writer yourself? Um, and where did that begin? Kind of talk me through that journey a little bit. Okay. But that's as far back as I remember. That's the only thing I ever wanted to do. Okay. They didn't allow me into the writing school until I was six. And I knew left and right. So I was practicing all summer until I turned six and they let me in the program and I got to ride on the ponies. Um, and it went from there. That's the only thing I wanted to do. Um, so when I finished high school, I uh, got an apprenticeship in Denmark. You have to be a, a licensed trainer to teach, or at least you had at that time. So um, I went in through this whole education system, which was, now I'm extremely happy that I have that background. It was super hard. It was a lot of cleaning stalls. And it's like being a working student for years, you know, and you just clean a lot of stalls and you teach all day long and you ride crazy young horses and you get all the horses nobody else wants to ride, all that. So um, I did that for um, for years until I um, moved to Germany. Mm -hmm. And... Um, continued riding there and training and moved. then let's say now I'm in my 30s I got my first child moved back to Denmark um, my ex-husband and I was we worked on a big riding school with a hundred horses we did uh, trained all the dressage and jumpers there and had another child and um, a few years later moved to uh, Florida. That was in 2004. And uh, I will say, since I moved here, things have gotten just better and better for me in my writing. I was able to focus more on my writing uh, when I came here and uh, I've had better horses than I ever had in Europe. So it's, it's, it was really, it really went um, forward after I moved here. Uh, do you want to hear more about what happened here? <laughs> that sounds wonderful. That was that was that was quite a journey. So it sounds like something that you knew right away at a very young age. Like you said, this is what you've wanted to do, and you've just been full steam ahead um, and really stayed focused on it. And what I've seen as a pattern of most writers who start at a young age is that your body can tolerate a lot of things when you're younger, right? You could fall off the horse and jump right back on and get on. And that just seems to be a part of the culture. Like we wear injuries sometimes like a, a badge of honor and you don't realize till your, your 30s and 40s that uh, you're not unbreakable and those things start catching up to you. And one thing that I'm glad you said, because I've tried to communicate this, um, is that writing is not enough. Um, I hear a lot of the time that I ride, therefore I don't need to exercise. And that is, that is my exercise. And you are noticing that when you do stuff out of the saddle, now it's almost a necessity because you've spent enough time just riding and you've done a lot of riding. So if anybody were to say that riding is enough, you would probably be one that said, I rode all the time, all my life, and it wasn't enough. Sure. Um, and from my standpoint, um, I, I work with riders on a daily basis, and you put enough force and wear and tear on the body in the same very specific positions. When you're riding, you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over. You're putting a lot of stress on very specific joints and muscles. And sometimes like when you do like how you were talking about Pilates, Pilates is going to be working a lot of opposing muscles that you typically don't use in writing. So you're actually treating and training your body to make it a healthy environment to handle this stuff on the horse. Right. Um, so is this something that if you could go back, let's say 20 years ago, what would you have told the Mika love 20 years ago to be doing? <laughs> I, would have, I would have said to her, I think you should start <laughs> doing something other than writing sometimes. Um, I do think Pilates is really is really helpful for uh, riders. I've done like math classes a little bit in the past, but nothing like now. I I go and take classes with the uh, reformer and everything. And what I think is really really important is as we ride, we get little um, we get crooked. You know, we, the body is a little bit crooked, like the horses are, and 
we can get into habits with our body that we can't really feel. I mean, you can see in the video, oh, you're sitting a little bit too much to the left, you need to sit more to the right, and as soon as you ride by yourself, you can't feel it anymore, and you slide back out there. And then the horses that you ride, they kind of adapt to that, you adapt to them. Um, and I think that if you do some training besides the riding, and now I'm, I can feel what's going on here doing the Pilates now, I can't cheat, you know, I, I do everything even, both sides, I have the same amount of weight on both sides, and so I, it straightens my body up and I can feel that I'm able to support my horses better um, that because my, my hips and my core has gotten mm. more even. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's a, that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing to bring up that we have these imbalances and that we can actually create imbalances and compensations in the horse as well. If we don't address that and it's not something that we feel all the time either. It's hard to be aware of these little minute compensations and things that are going on in the body. And that's one thing that I've really enjoyed. Um, I had no intention of working in the equestrian world three or four years ago, um, but I started studying something that's called muscle activation techniques. And what that does is it's a way to go through and assess the body and see where muscular imbalances lie. So anytime you have a muscular imbalance, meaning we are weaker in certain muscles or our ability to use those muscles than others, that starts creating compensations because we t tend to lean towards what our body knows best. So as we age, we start using more and more of the stuff that we know better and those little compensations get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So this wonderful methodology and tool that I have allows me to look at people and have them on a table and see where they can move and where they can't. And then we start bringing activation and strength back to stuff that was weak. So that way we can improve their imbalances. So they have less compensations. They become more aware of stuff that they're not strong or able to use and really bring them back into a more symmetrical and controlled place where that there, they can now sit more evenly on the horse. And like you said earlier, um, allow allowing the horse to move freely without the restrictions, right? Um, so there's there's tons of methodologies out there. I used to teach Pilates myself, um, so I know how uh, beneficial that can be. And that has kind of been my introduction to the world. I had, like I said, I had no intention of getting into this world, and it kind of found me. Um, and it's been this fun little um, journey as well, working with riders. Um, and I've, I've truly enjoyed it because you are – amazing athletes that have to have the awareness of a dancer while controlling a 2000 pound animal underneath you. And the only way to communicate with them is through your ability to move your body. So tell me, talk to me a little bit about, I would love to hear, um, what happens when we have these compensations or limitations or imbalances, whatever we want to call them. How does that not allow a rider to be able to do specifically they want to with their horse? Well, we are two individuals that have to connect mm -hmm. and the horse's back swings from side to side and we have to find that rhythm without moving, <laughs> sitting quietly up there and still follow the horse's rhythm and then um, be able to still support it and with our hips, you know, turn and, and move our seat bones up and down, left and right. Um, and uh, for me, I mean, what is the, the most important for me is that you can relax. So, so I'm going to go back a little bit and say a lot of people are focusing so much on the strength training right now, which is great. But we have to also remember that we still have to be supple and elastic and really soft. So we have to be able to relax these muscles also so we don't just sit up there. Because I see riders that go and they train and they get really stiff on their horses because they get so strong. But that's not the point really, right? We wanna be able to still follow the horse. So this strength should give us the ability to be um, better to follow the horse's movement. And at the same time, once you can sit elastic in the saddle and follow the movement, then see the way I drive my horse forward is a little different than a lot of other people. I bounce with the horse, okay? So it's like I'm sitting on a bouncy ball and I'm making that 
ball bounce more and more and you can't just bounce really hard on a bouncy ball right then it's gonna it's not gonna work so you have to go slowly more and more and more and that's how i make my horses move and that's how i keep mm -hmm. them so elastic in their body and uh, i don't press with my legs very hard i only give short impulses and then i take my legs completely off again so they hang softly so that's how i try to make my horses feel as comfortable as possible underneath me that i always sit really soft in the saddle and um, focus very much on, on following the horses if i was riding bareback got it got it so when you are out in your teaching clinics and working with someone that you maybe have never worked with before. Um, what is your approach in working with that person? What are you keeping your eyes on and trying to help them improve? Or, or what is maybe um, some consistent patterns you see of riders that you come across? So what I see a lot is people, because this is what we've been taught when we started riding, is like kick and squeeze with your legs and hold tight with your legs. And I'm just going completely away from that. So first of all, I'm taking my, telling my riders to take their legs off the horse. And first, when they do that, the horse stops because it's so used to the riders having the legs on all the time. So now I have to teach them to cut, use short impulses to make the horse go and kind of feel that. But the next thing is I want the riders to really try to sit with a soft leg and then feel how the back starts swinging. So this, they might go down in a lower tempo, shorter tempo, because a lot of times they're riding too fast. They're right, and when you push a horse fast forward, it can't swing. They can't swing softly and elastic under you. So if unless you're all strong enough to you know meet each other there, so I take them back in a shorter tempo so they can feel the horse's back swing, and then I teach them to follow that, and then through bending. Uh, it's easier you can't when if you just go straight if you do like bending lines uh like we call shoulder in position or circles lots of circles that'll give them a place to sit and and swing with the horse and then a lot of times i get this wow this feels really great <laughs> why didn't nobody ever tell me this before but um that is that is what i'm working on and and I feel that this is physical therapy for the rider and for the horse, because if you sit correctly and the horse is able to move correctly, we don't have all these back problems. We don't have all these joint problems. So, and they will, the horses will be nicer and softer to ride. So it sounds like sitting correctly is going to involve less effort in the, te in the, in the, te in the um, term of I'm not having to be so tense and tight all the time. And if I am learning how to correctly sit, it involves more of like a relaxed yet still strong where we need to be. Um, but it's like, I can, I'm not yelling through my muscles to the and horse at all times. I feel it in the apps and the apps yeah. burn and people are mostly, that's when I'm hearing like, Oh, I can't hold it anymore. <laughs> my mm -hmm. apps are burning. And then I'm happy. If they can feel the apps burning and they get a little sore in their hip joints, so they, we, we, we need um, a lot of strength and, and, and elasticity in, in the hip area, I feel like, um, because I'm teaching them to take their legs off. So now they have to balance on their sit bones and hold themselves in their core and lift their legs off. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a little bit of a strain on the, on the hip joints. And um, that's, that's something that, that's a good point to. to yes. Yes. And... I, I I love this. Videos. I love I love this. What's that? Yeah, I saw one of your videos where you were giving exercises on that exact area, and I was like, yes, this is what the riders need. Yes, and that's one thing that I've 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 found, and um, is that I I like the word elasticity, and to me that means I need to be able to control my joints through full ranges of motion. My muscles need to be able to control and move me through those full ranges uh, that that joint can create. Therefore, I'm able to control movement because if I can't, I'm just gonna be tight and I'm gonna hold on because I don't have that control. And it's a very interesting um, thought of being strong, being um, synonymous with tight, because in my world, 
what we've come to find is that when your body's tightening up and tense like that, that you were talking about earlier, it can actually come from a place of instability or weakness in the body. And what I mean by that is I want you to imagine that if you were to step out on an ice rink, you're just walking and then all of a sudden there's ice underneath you. The first thing your body's going to do is tense, tighten up, and you're going to walk very small steps. And that comes from your body recognizing immediately, Hey, I'm not in control here. I don't have stability under me. Therefore I'm going to tighten up to protect me. And so a lot of times what I found with my clients is as they age, they lose the ability to communicate and use muscles that they used to use as often, um, or maybe they've had injuries and now they have a hard time communicating with certain parts. Therefore, their body starts to tighten up because it's protecting them from saying, hey, I don't want you to use these certain muscles. Therefore, I'm going to tighten up and not let you have this full range of motion so that elasticity um, comes from us restoring their ability to use their muscles like they used to when they were younger. Therefore, they can still have this strength without the tightness. And you can have that suppleness because the body can relax and understand that it has it under control. Um, so you get this really delicate balance of being strong where you need to be, like your abdominals, that flexion, being able to bear down into the horse, but at the same time being light and supple in other areas. Um, so it is that delicate balance um, that you were talking about. And that's where I enjoy working with riders because just like you said, you can't be yelling at the horse the whole time by squeezing it and choking it to death and that your aids probably actually get a lot more effective when you're able to not be yelling the whole time and then give the clear aids like um, it's making me realize I know way too much about horses for not. Uh, <laughs> that's why I love having these conversations because I get to learn and now I'm like, ah, I'm talking about this thing that I had no idea of about four years ago. Um, but I love to hear that you're on the same page that it's about having the control and it, you're not out there just trying to put in as much physical effort everywhere as possible. Um, so with that being said, what would you say, is there anything in the last five or 10 years, maybe it's a new belief or behavior or just a new habit that you picked up that's most improved your life? Um, so my training life my, with my horses, cause I have changed uh, some, not a lot of things, but I have changed. But one thing that I have uh, been focusing way more on over the past uh, five years, probably, yeah, is um, making the horses more elastic. And how uh, do you do that? And I'm doing, I'm, I'm working with a physical therapist from Denmark and a good friend from, from Denmark, Klaus Toftgaard. And he comes over here on vacation in the winter and we hang out and we talk like you and I right now. And um, he has taught me a bunch of stuff on how to get the horses more elastic over the back without the rider, like how we can lunge them and stretch them and not be so afraid of letting the horse be without um, uh, side reins when you lunge them, like let them be long in the neck when you lunge them, lunge them over cavalletis, but let them move more freely. And uh, so do a little groundwork, uh, a lot of stretching. And uh, we keep very busy at the barn with the stretching of the horses. And uh, we, we do spend a lot of time uh, on that, on that particular thing now. So this way we have so we have to be better ourselves as riders because now we're getting our horses so nice and soft <laughs> everywhere but it all it goes hand in hand but since i've been more focused on my horses and i feel more i also could see where i, I needed help myself to uh, to be able to balance myself better yeah so that's wonderful so creating not only elasticity in the rider but actually being able to do that in the horse as well and both of those components need to exist and that you're doing that without the rider on it as well you you have um different strategies and ways of being able to improve the elasticity off the saddle um and so that is it seems like one can't really exist with the without the other one will kind of always pull the other one back is that correct yes Okay. And do you ever see this, 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 um, negative impact that the rider, what actually, let's take a step back. What is What happens when you have a horse that is 
getting more elastic and you're getting it into a place where it feels comfortable for you to ride. And then you get someone else on there who's not doing their work on their end. Um, what can that do to the horse? Well, that'll set the horse back because the horse, you know, it's like, I always feel like, um, using the backpack idea, <laughs> you can have a really comfortable backpack and you, and you have packed it correctly so that you can run or walk for a long time with it and it's not really hurting you or bothering you. But then you can also load it, just throw everything in there and the straps are not completely even and you have to go and do the same thing and you're gonna get in trouble. And I feel that that's the same way for the horses. You know, they, they, I can make, I can do as much as I can to make the horses really good, but if the rider isn't able to do the same, the horse still has to balance this rider. You know, so then the horse is going to start compensating again. So it's very, very important that we work on both the horse and the rider. And that's, I, I focus a lot on that. That's great. And I hear this, I hear this all the time too. I don't have enough time for anything but myself and I'm out there at the barn and I've got, you know, a job and I've got a family. What advice would you give to that person who wants to be able to get the most out of their rides, but comes to the party with saying, hey, I just, I don't have enough time to do anything for myself. But it's not, it shouldn't really take much extra time. Most people have time to at least spend 15 minutes on Facebook every day. <laughs> so true. <laughs> I'm sure they could take those 15 minutes and, and do some exercises because it doesn't necessarily have to take longer. Especially if you're, I'm, I'm riding a lot of horses. I, I need to be, you know, really fit and strong. If you have one horse and you want to do, and you only have an hour to ride this horse, you, you want to you wanna do that as, as good as you can. And you still have time to do some stretches and you still have time. You must have. I mean, if you want to do the right thing, you have to. There's just, that, there's no way around it. That there's, wonderfully says you must. Yeah, there is no yeah. shortcut, and that's one thing I always say in dressage. There is no shortcut. You gotta do you gotta do the right thing if you wanna make it somewhere. And and it's not only about making it somewhere in the sport. It's doing the right thing for the horse. I mean, for me, the horse comes first. The horse comes before the sport, the before the competition. So the most important for me is that if you only have a little bit of time every day, well, make sure you do the right thing during that time you have with your horse. That's wonderful. Doing the right thing for the horse. I think that's so powerful. I, I, I feel like there's a lot of people that I surround myself by that have that same horse comes first, horse comes first, horse comes first. And if the horse comes first, that means you actually need to put yourself first in the rest of your life by making that little bit of time to improve your physicality. So that way the horse can come first by you taking care of yourself. Um, and I love that you also said that it's, there's no shortcut and I'm going to go down this road a little bit, but, uh, I think one thing that I tend to see not only in the equestrian world, but in other sports as well, is we look for a lot of the times, uh, a, a silver bullet or the magic pill that you're going to have someone come in and teach a clinic and they're going to give you exactly what you need to make the rest of your writing fantastic. Right. And I get, I get kind of nervous, but I don't want to ever back down in saying that, Hey, I'm coming here. This is a day and it's going to take work from here on out. There's nothing that I'm going to do. That's going to change your life. And you actually have to put in the work outside of it. And so is this something that you, have you ever, have you ever noticed this in the world? Do you, what is your approach when you go into clinics, letting them know potentially like we, nothing's going to change dramatically in a day. This is going to be, you're going to have to do the hard work. Can you speak on that at all? Yeah, of course. Um, it's it's hard in, in this. This is such a big country and not everybody is able to have a trainer every day or on a regular basis. So they have to use clinics, you know, they so you will have somebody come in and it will be different people with different approaches and they will come in and give a two day clinic every now and then. It's not enough to it can never be enough to change somebody uh, completely <laughs> in, in two days. It's, it's just not possible. I like um, I like to go to the same places over and over. So I don't go, I try to not have too many different clinics, but go to the same, you know, the same groups so that we can continue to work on things. I give them homework when I leave. And then when I come back a month later or 
a month and a half later, well, then we can continue to work. Because again, like we talked about earlier, a lot of it is habits. And since I work so much with the rider's body, it's just impossible for me to, to make um, any big changes. But, but in the beginning, I feel like I can open their mind. I can help the riders open their mind a little bit to this um, body work and, and make them more aware of uh, how to feel the different things in the horse and their own body. That's wonderful. And it's going to help them have better rides and enjoy their time they spend with their horse and potentially show better as well. And so when it comes to shows as well, specifically shows, um, how do you, I think it's something that people would find very interesting. How do you specifically prepare when you're going to a show, whether it's physically or mentally or a combination of the two? So, um, I live a pretty busy life and here in Wellington where we have the most shows in the winter and I also have my normal work at the same time, meaning all my other training horses. I do try to do a little bit less of all my training horses on the days where I'm showing, especially if I'm showing at a higher level. Um, I try to keep my body a little fresh, meaning if I normally would ride five horses before, let's say I'm riding, I'm showing at three o'clock and normally I would have ridden five, six horses at that time. I'll skip a couple of them and maybe ride two horses. I think it's good to ride a little bit before to, to make my body feel good. Uh, and then I like to go home, take a hot shower, uh, lay down and, uh, I do hypnosis therapy. And, uh, so I will, um, do some, some, uh, of my, what do you call, listen to my tapes mm -hmm. or I'll just go over my test, um, visualize my ride and go over it and over it slowly. I know where the ring is. I really try to see everything around me and, and go through my test uh, slowly. And then I get up, get dressed, put my makeup on, <laughs> go, <laughs> go ride. So um, I, I make sure I eat. I like to eat egg in the morning so I have some protein. Um, I don't want to eat anything super heavy before I go and ride. I'll eat a lot when mm -hmm. I'm done. I to keep it like some toast and egg and, and not too much uh, before my rise. That's wonderful. It sounds like there is a, there is a combination of these three factors that are all doing the same thing. And that is preparation and reducing stress because you're not riding as much. Therefore you're not, your body's not going to be as stressed or tired. Then you go into this mental preparation where you're also de-stressing and getting prepared and confident. And then throughout the day as well, it seems like the food that you're putting in your body is not going to be internally as stressed as well. Cause that's going to be something that can negatively impact you. So I think that's super important that we're taking this approach of, we are taking the stress down and we're also getting, mentally prepared, visualizing and taking that time of just like stepping away from the chaos. Cause I know those shows can be super chaotic stuff going on everywhere and being able to make sure you're in the right mindset, your body's in the right place to, to get the most out of your, out of your show. So that is wonderful. I, um, I think that's super powerful. In Wellington, because I live so close to the horse show that I can go home and yeah. kind of restart, reset my buttons and stop yeah. for the show. But when I'm showing, um, other places, I will, I will try very hard to do the same thing, even if I have to go and sit in my car or sit in the truck um, for, um, for a little bit. I make sure I always have the time. And when, if I'm at the barn and I will take my time there, everybody around me, they know <laughs> when I close <laughs> my eyes, they don't talk to me. <laughs> I'll be in my zone. And everybody That's has to respect that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I appreciate that. That's, that is some great insight. And I know that uh, my audience will appreciate that as well. And so before we take off, Mikla, do you have any other closing words or recommendations or thoughts that you'd like to impart uh, on the audience before we close out this conversation? Um, what I'm always preaching is, and I tell everybody um, all the time, is enjoy the process. We all have these big goals. We all, all want to go to the Olympics. <laughs> Only <the> very few <laughs> <of you, laughs> will actually go. And don't be disappointed when you don't reach that goal. It's really the most important is to get the most out of your training every day and enjoy that. And then your success will come. And as it comes, that'll be the icing on the cake. But it really is the daily training that should be the most important for, for the riders. 
That's wonderful. Daily training, get the most out of it. Enjoy the process. Thank you so much, very much, Mikola, for taking the time and speaking with us. And uh, we enjoyed having you on here. Thank you. If you enjoyed this show, do me a huge favor and just share it with one person. That's all I ask. Share it with someone that either would find this educational or entertaining and uh, share it with them so we can get more people learning how to be better riders and take care of themselves and their horses. And if you wanna find more information about Mikola and see where she's doing her clinics or just get more information from her, uh, go over to Facebook and check out her page. It's Mikola Munter. Uh, the last name is M-U-N-T-E-R and Mikola is M-I-K-A-L-A. -A. So go check those out. And we've got so many great things coming up. Look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks.